Good afternoon, and it's a funny thing. I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and I'd like to welcome you to my home away from home. And uh, it's funny, I was driving here, and I was thinking, if it's raining, everybody says, my God, it's raining, nobody's going to show up. If the sun is shining, everybody says, it's a gorgeous day, nobody's going to want to be inside. If we've had two days or three days of pouring rain, and we have then a gorgeous day outside. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being here, and I don't blame you because um, it's wonderful to have Gloria Felt here today, and it's wonderful to have her here at the forum uh, in the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. We have been open, as most of you know, because you've been here for two and a half years. We're an exhibition space, we're an education facility, and we are dedicated to feminist art and to feminist thinking and theory and to educating uh, new generations about all of those things and about all the things that many of us have been thinking out about for a long time and that a whole new generation of young women and men are uh, growing up uh, thinking about. I received recently an invitation uh, to a benefit for, the, uh, for an Eleanor Roosevelt um, organization. And there was a quote on the front of it and it was, uh, her, her, she was talking about people and it was a little bit on the condescending hierarchical order in the reverse order that uh, people talk about ideas, uh, people talk about events, and people talk about uh, people. And what she was sort of saying was that, you know, people who don't think much talk about people, and people who think a little bit talk about events. That's sort of the implication of it. And people who really think talk about ideas. Well, I thought this was really kind of wonderful. And thinking about it today, I was thinking about, well, part of what's great about the center is that we do all three of those things in a wonderful way. And uh, we begin really with the dinner party and the women, the great women of history whose shoulders we stand upon. And uh, if they hadn't had their ideas, their ideals, and gone into action, um, we wouldn't perhaps be quite where we are today. So it offers a us the opportunity to revisit uh, the great work of great women in history and of course Margaret Sanger which is why we are here today with Gloria Felt is a guest at the dinner party and if you haven't been through it already and Gloria probably has a very nice big thing of it this is the dinner party plate that Judy Chicago um, designed and, and made in honor of Margaret Sanger and uh, if you haven't had a chance to go in and see Margaret Sanger, you might want to pay her a visit after we've heard uh, from Gloria. I invite you to do so. Uh, the first paragraph about Margaret Sanger in the Dinner Party book reads as follows. A visionary feminist theoretician and a pioneer in the struggle for reproductive freedom, Margaret Sanger was convinced that once women were freed of involuntary childbearing, society would be transformed. And um, our guest today, uh, the extraordinary, and you are, Gloria Felt has devoted her life to reproductive freedom and become an expert on Sanger, and we are here to honor Margaret Sanger's birthday. And actually, it was many months ago, it was last um, spring, that we realized that Gloria said, well, we, you know, Margaret Sanger's birthday is and say, oh, we said, well, this would be great. It's perfect. And time flies. And here we are. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to read uh, Gloria Felt's biography to you. Uh, as I introduce her, she's a women's activist, best-selling author of Send Yourself Roses, co-authored with Kathleen Turner, who we are honored to have here today. And I'd like to welcome you and to thank you for all your wonderful work. It's a pleasure to have you here. And also, uh, Gloria's written the, the War on Choice which actually I have it in my purse and I, met, I'm, I want to do this, so I'm going to do this with it at the end because it's a, it's a fabulous and very important book. And sort of the byline is, you know, the war that's going on right now against, uh, against choice. So um, thank you for that, Gloria, for, for your continued work. She blogs at her website, which is gloriafelt.com, about um, heartfelt politics, courageous leadership, and empowered women. And what I have here, they all have capital letters. So those are big deals. She's an expert on women's lives from where the personal meets the political, with over 30 years on the front lines of leadership for reproductive rights, health, and justice. 
during arguably the most challenging time since Margaret Sanger's birth, uh, Margaret Sanger's uphill battles, um, she revitalized the national movement, serving as president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America, one of my favorite, one of my mother's now deceased favorite uh, organizations, local, state, national, international. Thank you. And its political arm, the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, which she grew into the largest nonpartisan pro choice action fund and PAC from 1996 to 2005. She's currently writing a book about women's relationships with power to be published by SEAL in fall 2010 and welcomes your stories. I'm allowed to say this, right? This is an invitation of when you knew you had the power to fill in the blank, whatever it is. Her commentary has appeared in the New York Times, Salon Elle, Glamour, uh, The Daily Beast, and many others. She's a frequent speaker at universities, women's groups, and professional groups, and loves touring with women's girls, ladies, intergenerational fe um, feminist panel. And if you were here um, for that fabulous panel that we enjoyed having uh, the last wild card, um, if you weren't, you can go online and see it. It is up online. Put in EASCFA, Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, and you'll come to the video. And our wonderful videographer, David, who's here with us all the time, does it, and then we upload it. And you know, elect the electronic world has, has actually enabled this center to reach people, of course, all over. Those of you who are young aren't surprised about it. I am forever amazed and very happy. Back to glory. Vanity Fair named her their 200 top women legends, leaders, and trailblazers, Texas Monthly, naming her to its Texas 20. She hails originally from Temple, Texas, one of the few great things, <laughs> described her as part den mother, part businesswoman, part Mae West. Gloria is a fellow of the International Leadership Forum. She serves on the Women's Media Center Board of Directors Carol Jenkins, her, the executive director, is here, Yay Women's Media Center, and on um, the board of the Jewish Women Archive. She teaches women, which is wonderful, teaches women uh, power and leadership at Arizona State University and is a social media addict. Would like to hear more about that over drinks. She and her husband, Alex, who is here, have a combined family of six children, nine grandchildren, and this is really hard to believe, um, Gloria, three great-grandchildren. Please help me welcome <laughs> Gloria Felt. It's an honor to have her here. I have papers. Oh, my goodness. Um, momentarily. Tell you when? Okay. I don't know why, but the mysteries of technology elude me, even though I am a social media addict. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And Elizabeth, I've got to tell you, every time I'm here, I feel like I am on hallowed ground. You have no idea what it means. And I, I've heard a lot of people coming in saying thank you for providing this wonderful space. But for me, um, it is just... It really, it really does feel like hallowed ground, and, and I'm not kidding. I just got back from my high school reunion, and Elizabeth mentioned that I was born in Temple, Texas, but actually I went to high school in the teeniest town. It's so little and so awful now that we don't even have our reunions there. We have them in Abilene, which is the nearest sort of larger town that's, uh, that has actually a decent hotel you can stay in. What's that? Uh, do I have to tell? 50, 50, 50, 50, yes, mm -hmm. okay. And um, so how many of you go back to your high school reunions? I'm just curious about this, is this an experience? Okay, I'm not completely alone. I, I, I am so glad that I went. I traveled more hours getting there and getting back than I was there for the actual event. But it was so worth it. It was, um, it has been a long journey. It has been a long journey. Um, from, I, I, I'm sorry, but I get actually a little bit teary-eyed about this. I, it has been a journey from being a 16-year-old teen mom, that's me with my oldest daughter, 
to a women's movement, to having the opportunity to be a leader in the women's movement, to be able to do what I could to help other women be able to have more intention in their life than I had when I was a 16-year-old um, is, is, is beyond imagining as far as the honor is concerned. And to be here with all of you today in this beautiful Sackler Center for Feminist Art, which happens to be, I'm not exactly sure how far, but it can't be too far away from 46 Amboy Street, which is where Margaret Sanger opened the first clinic here in Brooklyn <laughs> in, in 1916. This, it, it, so you know what I mean when I say this is hallowed ground, and I'm totally amazed that I get to actually be here. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I have to kind of wonder also whether the girl who was born Margaret Higgins in, in Corning, New York, in 1879, the sixth of 11 living children, could have imagined that she would be immortalized as this flaming red vulva. <laughs> here in, uh, in, the, in the Brooklyn Museum. Maybe she would have. Maybe she would have. She was that sort of person. Uh, this is sort of her, her first leadership lesson that I learned from Margaret Sanger was that, that all worthwhile accomplishments start with a vision, and a big vision, not a small vision, not an incremental vision, but something big, bold, audacious, flaming red, and as she often observed, it needs to be something bigger than yourself, bigger than yourself to make it worthwhile. I've turned for her for inspiration and courage often, and also for practical examples of how to keep a movement moving in spite of external challenges and sometimes sort of an internal desire not to break too many eggs. Talk about that a little bit later. Today I want to focus on just nine of the many, many leadership lessons that I learned from Margaret Sanger over the years that, by telling you the story of her life and a little bit about her work. And then I'd like for us to talk a little bit about the challenges that are yet before us. I, um, a friend offered me tickets for a speech tonight by Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn. And I'm sure everybody here has been reading their wonderful media, and, and you may have even read their, their book, Half the Sky. And they're saying that women and the women's rights are the great moral challenge of the 21st century which I agree with, and I think it's great that they're doing that. But you know what? Margaret Sanger said all this 100 years ago. The, uh, she, was, she was a visionary. She was a visionary. She was a practical visionary. She was courageous, and she was cranky. She was idealistic, and she was also very pragmatic. She uh, was a red-headed, green-eyed feminist socialist who died a registered Republican. <laughs> <laughs> she was a mother, a grandmother, and a sexual libertine. She was a woman of many contradictions, but hey, aren't we all? The, um, this, is, this is Margaret Sanger as a young woman, and this gives me a chance also to, to give a shout out to the wonderful Margaret Sanger papers here at New York University, a great resource of information. and. Um, for which we are all grateful, and, and uh, hi, Esther Katz is here, and she is the leader of this pack and has done a remarkable job of, of putting together Margaret Sanger's papers. The personal and political intertwined for Margaret Sanger, as they do in my life and as I'm sure you all have felt that they do in yours as well. Margaret's earliest memories were of standing beside her mother's bed crying. Uh, after her mother had almost died from a very difficult pregnancy. Anne Higgins, Margaret's mother, was a devout traditional Catholic, and she, in fact, did die at age 50, simply worn out from so many pregnancies and births. Margaret's father, on the other hand, was a free thinker. He was a stonemason, a charmer. He loved to tell tales. He was a bit of a drinker, had a little trouble holding a job. So, he, uh, he was never the greatest provider for the family. And as a consequence, Margaret grew up knowing poverty. And she knew the struggles of women in a very personal way. 
And I have to suspect that it was also that her father's free-thinking sensibilities caused her to be able to see some different visions about how women might be treated in this world and, and, and <clears throat> helped to make her sort of the boundary breaker that she became. She went to nursing school. She started to nursing school, at least. She almost finished, but then she resigned because she couldn't, you couldn't go to nursing school then if you were married. So when she met this handsome architect, William Sanger, she deci and decided to get married, she had to resign from nursing school. But uh, she then proceeded to have three children in fairly rapid order and was trying to deal with some of the same issues that women today deal with, like how to balance motherhood and, her, and the profession of nursing that she really liked. And she liked being out there in the world and she liked rabble rousing, she already knew that. So when, the, when a fire destroyed the couple's home in suburbia, and they ended up moving back into the city. She was really quite pleased about that. And then William, her husband's mother, who had been widowed by that time, moved in with them, so she had a babysitter. And she went back to nursing. She went back to special duty nursing and uh, took special duty assignments. So if we can imagine, if we can sort of take ourselves back into the year 1912, it was a time of, of huge intellectual ferment, huge political change, of rapid immigration, economic turmoil, crowded tenements, and it was still eight years before women would get the vote in the United States. How many of you have been to the Lower East Side Tenement Museum? It's one of my favorites. I just, I just love it. Did you? Oh my goodness, wow, that's amazing. Well, in the 1900 census, in that particular building on Orchard Street, the census says that there were 18 wives living in that building. Those 18 wives had given birth to 111 children, of whom 67 were alive. Now that's a 40% infant and child mortality rate, which is shocking to us today. But back then, it was just the norm. Maternal mortality was 99 times what it is now. And of the, of the maternal deaths, 40% were caused by infection, and one half of those in deaths by infection were caused by unsafe abortion. Birth control such as it existed was illegal as well, largely because of this guy, Anthony Comstock. Anthony Comstock was sort of a one-man sex police. He started the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, a noble calling. <laughs> he was a special investigator for the United States Postal Service where he could personally enforce the 1873 law that was named for him, making it illegal to send birth control information or devices or abortion information or devices through the mail. There were many state laws that followed. Comstock bragged that he had seized 60,000 obscene rubber articles and tons, he said, of lewd and lascivious material. Like today's abstinence-only zealots, Comstock could not distinguish between healthy, responsible sexual expression and prostitution, promiscuity, and, and uh, pornography. Margaret soon demonstrated her second leadership lesson. A leader is someone who gets something done. Doesn't mean you have to be the smartest. It doesn't mean you have to have the most resources to bring with you. It means you have to actually get something done. The Nike swoosh had nothing on Margaret Sanger. She said, I have noticed that for those people who compromise by the excuse that the time is not ripe, the time never does arrive for decisive, courageous action. Mr. Comstock was about to meet his match. The defining moment came when Margaret Sanger was called to an overcrowded tenement to nurse a 28-year-old mother of three named Sadie Sachs. Now Sadie had been told another pregnancy would probably kill her. And she had asked her doctor at the time, well, how do I prevent these pregnancies then? 
And he very cavalierly said to her, well, tell Jake to sleep on the roof. Bitterly poor and weak from, from these multiple pregnancies, she had self-aborted. She got a raging infection, of course, pre-antibiotics. And Sadie begged Margaret to tell her how to prevent future pregnancies. Margaret told her what she knew, but she said it wasn't really very much. A few months later, Margaret was called back to the same home, the same situation. Sadie had become pregnant again, she had self-aborted again, she had gotten an infection. This time, she died. This just crushed Margaret, and she spent the rest of the night walking the street by herself. And by morning, she said she had decided that she would devote the rest of her life to finding out the answers and to making sure that women could have information about birth control, about contraception. The term birth control hadn't yet been invented. She said, no matter what it should cost, I would be heard. Now, we don't know whether there was a real Sadie Sachs or whether this was a composite of many women that Margaret encountered over time. It really doesn't matter because the point is leadership lesson number three. There is power in your story. There is such power in your personal story. And Margaret Sanger was a master at using the personal stories to inform people and to persuade people. And she told this story over and over and over again. And she told it dramatically. And she told it using every possible medium at her disposal. But she always connected that personal story with the call for political change. So she began to take some other actions. She wrote a sex education column called What Every Girl Should Know for a socialist newspaper, The Call. Comstock, of course, immediately censored it. And so the paper ran an empty space the following week with this headline, What Every Girl Should Know, Nothing by Order of the US Postal Service. <laughs> so then Margaret ratcheted it up another notch. She published a periodical called The Woman Rebel to challenge Comstock directly. About this time, a friend of hers coined the term birth control. And I think, you know, it's sort of like what the media mavens today call sticky, and Margaret recognized that, and she, she just ran with it and claimed it as her own. And she, if you ever have the chance to hear her talking about it or see her on one of the films that remains of her, she said it like, birth control. I mean, the, the emphasis was on the control. Margaret was arrested in August of 1914, and rather than, uh, be, rather than stand for trial at that time, she thought that she needed to let uh, public opinion get a little more aroused. So she fled to Europe. But she had a purpose for being in Europe also, because while she was there, she did a good bit of research. She researched birth control methods in France and discovered that women had been cooking them up on their stoves for many years. And she went to England, where um, she did a little research with the sexologist Havelock Ellis, where she began a long-term affair with him, actually. And they continued their deep intellectual bond, and he was a mentor of hers through the rest of her, his life. She also visited a clinic in the Netherlands. It was a family planning clinic where they had been providing women with family planning information and diaphragms for, I think, maybe 30 years. And this gave her the model that she would then use when she came back to the United States. And it also gave her the vision of having a network of clinics all over the country where women could get birth control. So the um, fourth leadership lesson that I learned from Margaret Sanger is the importance of timing. Because the time was ripe when she came back. I mean, have you ever seen anybody who looks so pretty and happy at their arraignment? <laughs> She sensed the tide was turning in her direction. While she had been in Europe, her husband, Bill, had been arrested for distributing birth control information and had gotten quite a bit of media for that. And her rival leader in the birth control movement, Mary Ware Dennett, had started the National Birth Control League. And so there was starting to be a sort of on-the-ground organization. And meanwhile, readers of The Woman Rebel were continuing to send the very charismatic Margaret letters of support. On January 17, 1916, on the eve of her trial, 
she gave what she called her maiden speech. It was a speech she would repeat 119 times all over the country. Here are some excerpts. They tell me that the woman rebel was badly written, that it was crude, that it was emotional and hysterical, that it was defiant and too radical. Well, to all these indictments, I plead guilty. Women from time immemorial have tried to avoid unwanted motherhood. On the one hand, I found wise men, sages, scientists, discussing birth control among themselves. But their ideas were sterile. They did not influence the tremendous facts of life among the working classes or the disinherited. I might have taken up a policy of safety and sanity, but would I have got a hearing? I put myself in the position of one who has discovered that a house is on fire, and it was up to me to shout the warning. And shout the warning she did. Leadership lessons five, six, and seven. Use what you got. And what you need is probably there if you are just smart enough to see it. And controversy is your friend. It gets people's attention. Outmaneuvered, the prosecution dropped charges against Margaret in February. So on October 16, 1916, she opened that first birth control clinic. Her sister, Ethel Byrne, was the nurse. They couldn't get a doctor to help them for quite a while yet. And they passed out these handbills through the neighborhoods. I'm going to just pass this over here so you can see. They That's the handbill that they passed out throughout the neighborhood in Brooklyn and on the Lower East Side, and it was printed in English, Yiddish, and Italian. The police closed the clinic down 10 days and 484 patients later. But Sanger had started something much larger than a clinic. She had ignited a great movement, a great movement for women's reproductive freedom. Ultimately, Margaret would be arrested nine times for civil disobedience, and each time she used what she had. Not money, certainly not the law, and few influential supporters who would step forward at that time. But she had the power of an idea that touched the most fundamental human need, and she knew it. This is my absolutely all-time favorite example of Margaret Sanger's brilliant use of the media to get her message out. In 1929, she was banned in Boston. She actually arrived, she was supposed to speak in Boston, and she arrived to find a newspaper headline that said that her speech had been canceled. But that did not stop her. She recruited the esteemed historian and Harvard professor, Arthur Schlesinger Sr. Uh, professor Schlesinger read her speech while Margaret stood beside him with this gag over her mouth. <laughs> Needless to say, it made all the major newspapers across the country, and you can just imagine if she had had Twitter and Facebook then, <laughs> what would have happened. Well, the Dear Mrs. Sanger letters really started flowing in there. Dear Miss, then, uh, Dear Mrs. Sanger, married tw at 20 to a laboring man. In 11 years, I have five living children, one stillborn and five miscarriages. I am desperate. Dear Mrs. Sanger, I am writing to you as the last hope of help. I am the mother of eight children, and I have nothing. I never expect to have but just children. She compiled these stories and many others into a book, Motherhood in Bondage, which inspired my own first book, Behind Every Choice is a Story, because honestly, in the 21st century, there remain many, many heartrending stories that women tell, and, and these stories still need to be heard. During this part of the, of the era, this era in the late 20s, I think in 1929, there was the first really successful um, court case, the US versus one package, that more or less began to convince doctors that they could safely provide contraception to their patients in their private offices. And so more doctors started providing contraception, more people started thinking well, that they would start opening these family planning clinics. And Margaret began to crisscross the country then, helping people open clinics all around. This, um, I love this picture. This is a picture of Margaret Sanger in Tucson with patients and their, 
children of patients, it appears, also, at the Mother's Health Clinic in 1936. She helped them get started in 1934, and in the late 1930s, she and her second husband, Noah Slee, retired in Tucson. She never really retired, but he retired. He wanted to retire. He was considerably older than she, and she also, um, she, one of her sons had asthma, and so they, she wanted to, to move to a drier climate. So she was uh, traipsing around, helping people start clinics. And by this time, where she, wherever she would go, it was not unusual for the most prominent women in the city to help her out. So she was beginning to really mobilize support all over. In my case, I, I ran the Arizona, the uh, uh, affiliate in the Phoenix area for some years, and Peggy Goldwater helped her, helped Margaret Sanger to start that affiliate, which always comes as a surprise to people that uh, the Goldwaters were intimately involved with Planned Parenthood even back then. So her second husband, Noah Slee, as I said, was considerably older than Margaret, and he was just totally besotted with her, so much so. He was a, a millionaire, the founder of the three-in-one oil company, and um, he would do things like, at her behest, smuggle diaphragms into the country illegally. Um, he staked the Holland Rantos Pharmaceutical Company so that they could increase the supply of diaphragms and jelly in the United States. And he ultimately contributed just loads of his own money and time to her, her efforts, while at the same time providing her with separate living quarters, which she demanded as, a, as her condition for marrying him because she wanted to be able to continue living as she so pleased. And she did. Well, by 1942, there were over 80 local clinics around the country. And that was the year that the Planned Parenthood Federation of America was formed. Now, Margaret Sanger hated the name Planned Parenthood. She thought it was weak, that it was a euphemism for what she was all about, which was, after all, birth control. Well, she was obviously wrong about that <clears throat> because Planned Parenthood has turned out to be one of the strongest brand names ever. But I will have to say that that conflict over style and strategy continues to rage <laughs> within the movement to this day. And though Margaret continued as the honorary chair of Planned Parenthood, she also, as the organization became more mainstream, she also looked for other challenges that she could take on elsewhere. So in 1952, she founded the International Planned Parenthood Federation. And she also began raising money for research to fund uh, the development of a birth control pill. She was convinced that an effective oral contraception would be, would be ultimately the transformational thing, uh, that, that there would be a method that would be woman controlled and that that would be the, the contraceptive method that would transform uh, women and free them at last from motherhood in bondage. The birth control pill saved my life when I was, um, by, by the time I was 20, you saw me at 16, by the time I was 20 I'd had my third child. And um, I, they, my children had been the center of my life, but that was enough. And uh, so when the FDA approved the birth control pill in 1960, uh, well actually it was 1962 by the time it got to West Texas, it, it truly saved my life. It allowed me to have a life. It allowed me to think about a life beyond the constraints of, of motherhood and wifedom. Then birth control was finally legalized throughout the United States in the Griswold versus Connecticut United States Supreme Court decision in 1965. Roe versus Wade followed in 1973. Both of these cases were based on the right to privacy. Also about this time, there was funding for, thanks for coming Kathleen. I, I didn't mention, I should mention also that Kathleen is also the chair of the Planned Parenthood National Board of Advocates. So thank you, thank you, thank you darling. <laughs> Uh, so so the, there was funding for family planning for low-income uninsured women for the first time. Today, more than 95% of Americans have used birth control. And when the Mayflower Moving Company surveyed its clients a few years back, and they asked them, what are the items that they would take 
by themselves, if they're moving, what are the items that they would carry with them on their own persons uh, it, because they valued them so much? Birth control pills were among the top four. <laughs> now that is a culture shift. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Margaret was far from perfect. She was egotistical. She rarely credited others' contributions to the efforts. And though she was unwavering in her mission, she changed her argument based on whatever was selling at the time. Her strategy was go to where the power is to help accomplish what she wanted to accomplish, and what she wanted to accomplish was to get birth control available to all women. That's how she came to align with eugenicists during the 1930s when that sentiment was at its height. She saw through eugenicism sooner than most and broke away from it publicly, but still, this has remained a stain on her personal narrative and the one that is most difficult to remove. Because we have to remember that those who are opposed to women's equality in any form will always use it against her and will use it against the movement, even though she more than redeemed herself later on and actually ended up being among the first visible leaders in the US to um, denounce Hitler's racism. Sanger just continued to morph her arguments as she needed to. Women's health, poverty alleviation, population control, every child who wanted child, whatever you were buying, that's what she was selling. Uh, all of these are valid benefits of birth control. But I still really and truly believe that the feminist crusade for women's biological and sexual liberation was where Margaret Sanger started and the core principle to which she continued to return over and over and over in her life. I had a wonderful dear friend, now deceased, Alice Bogert, who entertained Margaret Sanger in Chicago um, several times when she was there to speak during the 1930s and 40s. And Margaret told me what she, I mean, uh, excuse me, Alice told me what she, I think, thought was a little secret. She, you know, like whispered in my ear, I think she quite liked the gentleman. <laughs> Indeed, she did, and the gentleman liked her too. She slept with most of the most interesting men in the 20th century, <laughs> including H.G. <clears throat> including Wells, who would call her later the heroine of the 20th century. And you know, I mean, all of these guys remained her friends and her dearest supporters through, through the rest of her life or their lives. Margaret loved parties. She especially loved international themed costume parties, and she threw them often. Her friend Grace Sternberg in Tucson told me that Margaret was also a notoriously bad driver, that when she was on the road, people knew just get out of the way. She fancied herself an artist. I had one of her watercolors in my office in Arizona, and I will tell you it's a good thing she had another calling in life. <laughs> However, in less than a century, the movement that Margaret Sanger launched won so many victories that it is really hard these days to get anybody to think that those, those rights could ever be reversed. I mean, that is really one of the biggest challenges I think that the movement faces now. It is, it is such an amazing change that people simply cannot believe that these advances could be reversed. I, that was certainly the mood when I went to my first Planned Parenthood job in West Texas as, as the CEO of that affiliate in 1974. Everybody just thought, mm, done done. We can just go about providing our services and everything will be fine. But the backlash against such a sweeping change in the gender power balance was bound to, to, to be immense. I mean, it, it was just, I don't think there has been such a huge sea change in a power balance that affects everybody in our entire culture ever in, in human history. And, and we should have known that there would be this huge sweeping uh, backlash, and that is why the war on choice rages on today. And that is why I want to tell you about the eighth leadership lesson that I learned from Margaret Sanger, which is a movement has to move. It has to move. Power and energy come from moving into new places, not from standing still and doing what you've always done. That's why, as Planned Parenthood president, I tried to focus on building the grassroots and, and we started advocating a much more proactive agenda and trying to raise the profile as both a service provider and a political force. And I think that our great challenge now is to shift the moral and legal framework from privacy, which we are all accustomed to, to a human rights framework. 
I, I, I can't say how strongly I believe that this is important, that women's human right to make their own childbearing decisions has to be has to be the framework that we go forward in and to connect those reproductive justice issues with economic justice issues and to say clearly and unequivocally that it is time for women to have an equal place at life's table. And in the immediate future, of course, this means we need to take this on in the health reform debate. For as Margaret Sanger said so many times in so many ways, no woman can call herself free until she can own and control her own body. That was her core conviction, but nobody knew better that convictions alone are not enough. And so the final leadership lesson is the one that I hold most dear, and I think it's a good summation of Margaret Sanger's life. Life has taught me, she said, we must put our convictions into action. So I want to just give you one last little story and then take questions. Not long before she died in a Tucson nursing home in 1980, excuse me, 1966, a few days shy of her 88th birthday, although the New York Times obit said she was 82, which would have pleased her immensely. Her granddaughter and namesake, Margaret Sanger Lampy, asked her how she'd like to be remembered. She said she hoped she'd be remembered for helping women. And helping women in the end is all about what Margaret Sanger did. Thank you. Thank you. So since tomorrow is her 130th birthday, how about a big happy birthday, Margaret? <laughs> happy birthday, Margaret. <laughs> right. So I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has or comments. Um, yes? Well, the reason I came here today was specifically because I went to an adult camp this summer, and the lecturer gave a talk on uh, topics, <clears throat> with continuous, uh, topics that we don't read about or that we don't study in high school or in college. And one of them was the Spanish Civil War, Mm -hmm. And he gave us a brochure from the, Hol uh, the Holocaust Museum here in New York, uh -huh. which was the idea that uh, Hitler was using eugenics to make right. a master race. And he mm -hmm. went into a whole thing. And then he drops Margaret Sanger's name. And I said, oh, it can't be. Can't be. And so he said, yes, yes, yes. And I said, well, I will go home and do some research on it. This is the first time, because this was just a few uh -huh. uh, Ah, thank now you. I, Do you have a question? The question is, where can I get more information ah, okay. about Ah, okay. Well, first of all, a <laughs> couple of places. I'll give you a couple of places. Specifically as related to Margaret Sanger? Excuse me? Specifically as related to Margaret Sanger? Yes. Or, okay, yes. yes. A couple of places. First of all, I, I, I can't overly highly recommend uh, NYU and Esther and Kathy, if you want to raise your hands back there. We have the experts here in the room. You might want to talk to them before you leave, and um, they can direct you specifically. Also, the Planned Parenthood Federation of America website um, has uh, a, a several articles about Margaret Sanger and really goes into detail about the eugenics allegations and what's right, what's wrong. Um, a lot of it is just plain made up that, that, that is out there. And a lot of, I mean, and in some of it is simply that in the culture of that day, the language that she used was the same language that Teddy Roosevelt used, the same language that, you know, that leaders in the country were using because they were all I I of this persuasion. So you have to sort of pick, pick the pieces apart. Thank you. Yes. Yay. We did a piece on uh, Master Kathy Ward at the center. I don't Wonderful. Um, I, my question is, um, I, I do history pieces, and that's why I went to the center and did this piece. And um, one of the things I mentioned in an article, I used the word, uh, like maybe anti-choice propaganda, because so many of what she has said is very twisted and is even inaccurate. Mm -hmm. also have a lot of problems with things that Margaret Sanger did and, you 
know, they don't consider themselves as, as running into that. They think they're feminine. And we went back and forth, and um, I had the idea of possibly, you know, can we go mm -hmm. use the blog to explore some of these statements or some of these possibly troubling things that she did. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, it, you know, I think it's uh, the more information that's accurate information that's out there, the better. And I think w I mean, we have to be realistic. We have to tell the, tell the speak the truth. And, and that's where the, there are issues that we would have if we were hearing Margaret Sanger speak today. There's no question about it. Just as, you know, l let me give you another example. I don't know if any of you have read, um, I don't know if any of you have read Michelle Goldberg's book, The Means of Reproduction. And, you know, she's, she gives the history of the population control guys in the 1950s and 60s, the Rockefellers. And you know, if, if, the reason we have such widespread family planning services around the world is because these guys, they were all into population control. Well, we don't particularly like that approach either. We, we think the approach should be women's reproductive self-determination and women's rights. Um, so you have to just, you know, you have to sort of take it all and take it in the context of the day. And, uh, and ultimately, honestly, when you read Margaret Sanger's words and you read, look at her whole life, there is no question that that one statement that I made, no woman can call herself free until she can own and control her own body. If there was a thesis for her life, that was it. I mean, if there was a guiding principle for her life, that was it. And I think we need to just keep reiterating that. And I, I wanted to give you one more resource. <clears throat> that I, uh, if, if you haven't read uh, Ellen Chesler's excellent biography of Margaret Sanger, it also, I found it particularly helpful for putting the cultural context and the political context of the different decades in which Margaret lived into perspective. Yes. Uh, that would be my question. What was her relationship to the suffragettes? Oh, good question. Uh, the suffragists wouldn't take on birth control. I think that kind of ticked her off, actually, but uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't take it on. They by that time the suffragists had become a fairly narrow movement. They were de determined only to focus on, on getting women the right to vote. And in yeah, right. They 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 really by that time had pretty much sort of gone. The, the, even the, previous to that, the suffragists, the women's movement in general, had had a much bigger agenda, social agenda. But by the time 1920 came around and they actually got the right to vote, that had they had just focused solely on getting the right to vote. And, and did I say something wrong, Esther? I, I want you to I want you to I want you to pipe up if I I want you to keep me honest here. <laughs> yeah. They, they thought birth control would make them promiscuous. That the the, 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 the suffragists had come out of the the uh, 19th century, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, voluntary. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why there were splits in the early movement? You said that she had some conversation in terms of whether it's birth control mm -hmm. organizations. And then on hope and weekend, what was the conversation in the 2009? Good. First <laughs> 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 right. Right. Great. Great. Um, in terms of why there were splits in the in the movements, I, you know, part of it was just sheer ego. Part of it was just sheerly that there were these these women who were they were each in their own way leaders and boundary breakers, and they each just knew that they had the right. Path and, the, and and also they were egotistical enough to want to be the the figureheads and I have to tell you it's still that way in the movement. <laughs> you should see the you know you get bruised hips at the microphone when you have a coalition press conference, so that that hasn't really changed too much and uh, probably never will. In terms of what needs to be done today, <clears throat> no, let me say one more thing about that though. I think I think that's I, I don't want to make too much light of that because there always is in advancing social movements. Once you begin to start winning something, then you have something to lose. And as soon as you have something to lose, and you've seen this in the civil rights movement, you've seen this in many other movements, if, if you just sort of look at all of them, once you have something to lose, <clears throat> then there are always people within the movement who say, oh, 
let's not try too hard, let's not try to break too many you know, uh, doors down, let's, not, let's be quiet because otherwise we'll lose whatever it is that we have already obtained. So I think that that, that is also something that just happens in every social movement and it is, it, it, to, to me, the biggest challenge that I ever had always was trying to get past that and trying to get people to continue to you know, to keep their courage on and to keep realizing that there were more injustices to be dealt with and that we needed to keep pressing forward. And, and so that's just, that's just a fact of human nature. Uh, as to what we need to do now, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I've been quite disappointed that there hasn't been a, a real outcry. And not just about abortion, but the way Obama just let family planning disappear from the first stimulus package with, a, oh, well, it's, it's controversy, okay, oh, we will take it out. Um, he needs, and, I, and when, when, if you talk to people in the White House, what they will say to you and what they have said to Planned Parenthood and what they have said to the women's organizations is, well, you need to come to us and show us that you have enough people who care about this. In other words, they're not going to go fight that fight for us. And so, uh, so it's going to take, that's what it's going to take. And, uh, I don't know, we'd have to sit down and strategize what would be the proper civil disobedience, but I'm kind of up for it myself because, I, see, I don't have anything to lose anymore. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me anymore. I can, I can do whatever. Yes, did you have a question? Oh, yes. Uh, um, yes. I just wanted to ask you elaborate on something that's uh, mm -hmm. so recent and so true, which is that the whole argument for Yes. Well, one thing has already been done, and I think that maybe this is part of the answer to your question about how do we start moving forward in another direction. And that is that there was some legislation called the Freedom of Choice Act uh, that was written about 20 years ago, but it basically just tracked Roe v. Wade, and it, was, it just reinforced and codified a right to privacy. A few years ago, we rewrote the Freedom of Choice Act. It's still called the Freedom of Choice Act, and it still starts with some of the same preamble about privacy and individuality and so forth. But then when you get down to what the actual law is, it is a civil rights law. It is a, the government cannot discriminate against you if you choose to have a child. The government cannot discriminate against you if you choose not to have a child. And that's the beginning of it, because a human right has to be then translated into a civil right that can be codified. And so that legislation w is based on what we thought was the best state law, which was uh, Washington State, that has had this law for many years. And it has never been successfully challenged in court, and we felt like that was the best model. So that piece of legislation has been written, it has been introduced, has not been introduced in this session. I would like to see a very strong mobilization around the Freedom of Choice Act. I also am crazy enough to think that these egg as person state initiatives, state ballot initiatives that are popping up all over the country are a good thing because those finally will force the pro-choice movement to grapple with what it hasn't wanted to grapple with, which is straight out, what's the value of a woman's life? You know, it's not enough to argue that it would be confusing, it's not enough to argue that, you know, that there would be all these legal complications. It's, it's, we have to begin to start with the woman, start with the woman's basic right to her own life, to her own existence, to the physical body that she has, and to making decisions about her own body and her own life. And frankly, uh, I think there's been a lot of shying away from that. And so using Margaret Sanger's controversy theory, I think that that needs to happen. And then to translate that, I think we're probably not going to get it in this healthcare round. It's not going to happen. But I think we have to start building again from the ground up and get rid of the Hyde Amendment, and get rid of the Helms Amendment, and that means winning another election or two. Yes? In your opinion, how good or bad a mother was born in China? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. You know, her grandchildren thought she was fabulous, but, you know, grandchildren and grandparents always <laughs> think each other are fabulous. Her, her children, her children, her, her sons, her daughters very sadly died um, in childhood, and that was a... a sadness from which Margaret really never recovered. She, she talked about this child uh, for the entire rest of her life. 
the two sons were both uh, very uh, successful people, had good family, great family lives themselves. Uh, so there had to be something good there, but they complained a lot about her absences, and there are stories of, you know, of, of a son saying, would you please write me into your calendar, Mom, for Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know. So um, I suspect that she, she was an absentee mom quite a bit. At the same time, they seemed to be, be rather proud of her. One of them had lots and lots of children. How many children did? Six, Six yeah, and, 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 and she was quite embarrassed by that. But um, otherwise, uh, <laughs> otherwise it was okay. Yes. Bondage. Mm -hmm. Piece of anatomy, and if you can at least walk around uh, so that you can see the backs of the runner pieces, especially um, Susan B. Anthony. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the story is where we can see it. Um, when these back pieces through Chicago said that's because they were. Mm. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind that these 39 women, including these two, despite their faults or their backs, um, were chosen out of 4,000 pieces. So uh, Susan B. Anthony is the queen of the table, but you were pleased to have a feeling already that Margaret Sanger was just flaming. Yes, uh, very so flaming, I yes. <laughs> Well, Kathleen went to see the exhibit before she came in here, and she, her comment to me about Margaret's plate was, Woo, she was angry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I mean, every time I look at it, I see something new. I saw a question back here. Yes. Very, very interesting question, and um, I, I'm going to just do one little disclaimer, which is that since I have not been the president of Planned Parenthood for four years now, I don't know exactly what's going on right now in that particular conversation. I do know that, that over the years we had formed increasingly close coalition relationships for many, many different reasons. And so I'm hopeful that there is a dialogue going on. You know, the thing about Planned Parenthood and the thing about the reproductive rights movement is that we actually, we, we want to get at whatever the facts are. And so it's unfortunately, those facts may get caught up in a, you know, in a political ringer. And that is, as you, I mean, as you pointed out, that is always the challenge. 
Um, but it's, none, none, none of it can be avoided. I mean, we, we have to keep going forward and we have to keep t uh, looking to what the very best is. And of course, as time has gone on, there are also new and different methods of birth control that come into play. The birth control pills that are being used now have like just a minuscule amount of, of uh, hormones compared to the Enovid E pills that I was popping back in 1962. <laughs> So it's a different, you know, lots of things are different, and um, it's just important to keep the facts out there and to keep, keep marching forward. Are you, it, how's our time? I, I forgot to ask you. Are we okay? Okay. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. for women's health. But that is not something that our society has ever been willing to, to deal with. And uh, so there you go. There's another little controversy you can go stir up if you want to. Yes. <laughs> This is like, so no, she wasn't instrumental in developing the diaphragm. This is, this is my, my, after Margaret Sanger, this is my next most fun thing to talk about. So another time, I'll, I'll do a whole thing on, on the history of contraception. Because birth control has been around since before people knew what caused pregnancy. I mean, women have been coming up with different things that would help them to not have children when they had sex. And there have always been many reasons for wanting to do that. And so there have been things like, I mean, in, in the, ancient, uh, the ancient Egyptians mixed crocodile dung with, with honey. Sounds really good, doesn't it? And used it as a pessary. They put it in the vagina to, to block the sperm. Um, Casanova, Casanova was supposedly used a squeezed lemon half. He had his partners used to put a squeezed lemon half over their cervix. And, and you know what? It was a really good contraceptive method because it was not only a barrier, but the lemon juice was actually acidic and it killed the sperm. So there have been, you know, and then uh, there have been, uh, there have been uh, like condoms, which were called sheaths, made out of animal guts for many, many centuries. So by the time Margaret Sanger was around, actually in the, in the late 1800s, the newspapers all over the country carried advertisements for things that would help ladies relieve their symptoms. And um, so there were like all these nostrums. Some of them worked, some of them didn't work. Most of them didn't work. But yes, people knew withdrawal. People, of course, knew abstinence. People knew uh, the condom. People knew, um, and of course, with the, then with the advent of, of latex, all, you know, the condom became a much more prevalent method. But the diaphragm was, uh, I, I presume, invented in, in the Netherlands. That's where Margaret first encountered, encountered the the diaphragm as we know it today, and contraceptive jelly. But women from time immemorial have, have cooked up, like the French women that Margaret Encounter did, they've cooked up their own remedies and uh, found ways. Women have their ways, yes. <laughs> yeah, suppositories, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's, yeah. Well, it, it starts, it starts uh, with, as you say, from birth, it starts at birth, it starts with, with girls, it starts with how girls are educated, how they're socialized, how girls are, are given um, ideas of themselves as capable, powerful human beings who can have a life with intention and know what they want to do in this world and, and that they have a, a right to all of those things. So yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely, it's a bigger framework. But you know, I think that strategically the reason it's a much better framework, in addition to the fact that it's the right thing to do, is that when you have been on a, when you've been in a, in a fight or you've been in a battlefield where, where it's just intractable, which the, the, the debate has become intractable in many ways, what you have to do is you have to create a different field. You have to create a different framework in which you're actually fighting the, the fight. And I think looking at a woman holistically is, I think it'll even work better these days because, because women now are more than 50% of college students. Women are now mm, about 50-50 in the medical profession and in, you know, the, in, in law school and even in some religious seminaries, women are half or more of the, of the students. And so we're gonna have a generation of women now who I hope will take this mantle on and take this torch on and just take it places that we would never have even imagined. Am I overly optimistic? I think so. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, let me, um, let me just close with, um, with one more little story about Margaret. I love these little anecdotes. So I, 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 they're, they're not always right to the point of the social movement, but, but I love this one too. Her grandson, Alex Sanger, told me this story that, her, uh, that Alex and his father, Margaret's son, Grant, and Alex's, all of the siblings went to visit Margaret in the nursing home in Tucson not long before she died. It was uh, New Year's Day. And she was, she was kind of in a semi-coma. She didn't recognize the grandchildren. And uh, it was kind of sad. But then Grant popped the cork on a bottle of champagne, whereupon Margaret bolted up <laughs> out of her near coma and said, give me a drink. <laughs> she loved champagne. The nurse came by and said, no, you know, you can't, you can't have champagne. So Margaret began to scream, bloody murder. The doctor came in soon, and uh, very shortly, Margaret was sipping her champagne through a straw. And so we can say happily that we know Margaret Sanger was, was living her life with intention. She was uh, the woman who believed women must not accept, women must challenge, was challenging until her very last breath. Thank you all so much for being here. mention about the dinner party and how to see the back of the runners. Yeah, please. I'm just going to let people know. Before everybody leaves. Oh, yes. Right. Um, if you go on one of the four computers that are around and navigate in, it, we, when, when the dinner, before the dinner party opened, we had these marvelous cameras come in with a very long dolly. And you can actually, with your finger, move into the center of the dinner party on these computers and move around and go in and see the back of the banners close up. So and that's something, I don't know that you can do that at home, but you can certainly, I don't know whether or not that's possible at home, but you can certainly, you can do it at home as well. Um, but you can certainly do them on these four, so I wanted to tell you that. Um, this was really one, wonderful. I was thinking, Gloria, when you were talking about really reframing, how to reframe this from privacy to, to uh, human rights, is that there must be a PR agency on Madison Avenue in this city who knows precisely how to reframe. 
and to begin a dialogue with some people who are in that area to move it not just from a legal, um, a, a legal point of view, which I think is, is vitally important, but also uh, in terms of public relations. And I would think, considering the ad campaigns that go on and how people can be moved around uh, by their noses, there's probably somebody in this city who would really uh, be able to strategize about reframing. Um, I also wanted to say that when, when you were chatting, uh, no, who, who uh, was the young woman who was talking about we live now till we're 100 and something years old? The, uh, the, no. <laughs> no, but there's, there's really, I mean, a wonderful thing is happening. I'm 61, and I think many women will tell you after they've gone through menopause, there is a new life. And it's the freedom that you have with your body, with your choices, and it is that, that kind of life that one wants to create for women who are of childbearing age. Um, how great sex becomes when you're after 60, that's a whole other discussion, we'll do that another time. My granddaughter, Madeline, came up to me um, the other day, and she likes, she's discovered how to get a rise out of um, her grandmother, and so, well, not me, the other grandmother. And she sort of pulled, pinched my arm, she said, oh, you're getting soft. And she loved that, she looked at me with this really mischievous glare. And the second time she did it, I said, yes, isn't it wonderful, I'm so wise. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, when I get soft, I get wiser. She said, you do? I said, yes, absolutely. The softer you get, the wiser you get. So you really have something to look forward to. So I just passed that little possibility of turning life around. In the back, we have a sign-in sheets if you'd like to be on our um, email mailing list. We have what's happening, so you can see all of the wonderful things that are going on in the center and in the museum. And um, on uh, October 18th, from 2 to 4 here in the Forum, um, artist Linda Stein is coming, and she's doing an artist talk, and she's discussing her upcoming exhibition, Women of Valor. Uh, which is going to be in Chelsea, in her book, The Power to Protect Sexism in the Art World and Gen Gender Issues from a Global um, Perspective. So I hope you'll join us. Gloria, thank you so much. Thank you for all of the good work, and thank you for all coming and all of the work you're all doing and the action that we're all going to take to move us forward. Thank you.